Today in Financial Markets Microstructure we have an exercise class. We have some catching up to do. So we will be revisiting a lot of the problems that uh, I assigned you in previous lectures and that we had in the first problem set, uh, but that we never went uh, through. So in particular, uh, we will be doing the two exercises from lectures 7 and 8 respectively. And those will have to do with order flow payments and uh, trading costs set by exchanges. And after that, we will go back to problem set 1 and do a few things uh, with exercise 3. So I will not go through this through it uh, completely, probably, because you have solutions on Epsilon, but there are a few few things that I wanted to outline to clarify compared to those solutions so we will spend quite a bit quite quite a bit of time on that exercise as well so let's begin our trip to the past with exercise 5 from chapter 6 that we did on lecture 7 this is the first time i noticed that this is 567 this exercise had to do with the make and take fees and bid-ask spreads. So first of all, to just try to recall what was that, what happened on lecture 7 and what happened in chapter 6 of the textbook. So chapter 6 was about limit order book markets, order-driven markets. And we did a quite a few things in that general framework. So on lecture 6 we did the Glostons model. Uh, yeah, Gloston's model explored how to optimally submit limit orders given some exogenous arrival of market orders. And in that case, limit traders traded off their execution risk against a better price. So they were indifferent between lower execution probability and uh, getting a better price. In lecture 7, we took that Gloston's model and uh, did a few things in relation to market design with it. So we discussed a few aspects in which markets may differ and how should we design markets in order to get better liquidity, better functioning markets according to Gloston's model. And then, the most relevant for today, is we looked at the parlors model. And that model had to do with the choice between market orders and limit orders between making and taking liquidity so that's the model that we'll deal with today and this problem in particular relates with um, trading fees so consider the parlor model i have rephrased the problems uh, slightly so instead of a wall of text you have a slightly more structured problem but it's the same problem um, as in the textbook it's just written slightly differently so consider the parallel model. Uh, trading platforms often charge different fees for market and limit orders. So let us have FMO to be the fee per share paid by a market or a placer. Yes, okay, sorry, I, I blinked out for a second. Because I thought these fees were per order share, per yeah, per order rather than per share, but in this model these are equivalent. So okay, FMO is the fee per share paid by a market order placer, and FLO is the fee per per share for a limit order. And uh, for limit orders, this fee is paid whenever the order executes, if it executes. So there is no submission fee, there is no entry fee for limit orders, but there is execution fee. And for market orders, this distinction does not really matter. And we will let F with no subscripts denote the sum of the two. So it'll be FMO plus FLO. So this will be the total revenue that the, sh uh, that the exchange gets per, per trade. 
because on the one hand there was there is a limit trader who submitted a limit order and this limit order will be executed against a market order so the exchange will get something from both the market order and from the limit order it will get both fees so I realized that lecture 7 was quite a bit ago, what's it been, 5 weeks and something? So let us do a quick refresher of uh, how it looks like, how the model looks like. So I'll begin with the model that we've seen on the lecture. And it's slightly different from what we have in the textbook and what the problem wants us to look at. Uh, but we'll get to that in a second. So what we assumed in the lecture is that there is one asset, as usual with fundamental value V, and this time this V is commonly known, so there is no adverse selection. We assume that there are some exogenously fixed bid and ask prices, A and B. So they're just exogenously fixed. And we assume that every period there was one trader arriving at the market. And this trader was choosing between buy and sell, of course, and also between limit and market orders. And the trader could only, could only submit an order for one unit of the asset. So, as I said, I already managed to get confused in that today. But yeah, so one unit only. The trading protocol is such that if... A trader submits a market order today, well, obviously they trade against a limit order from the limit book, or from the limit order book. If the trader submits a limit order, it will be only valid for one period. So if a trader submits a limit order, then this limit order will only execute if the next period trader will submit a market order. And otherwise, this limit order is just cancelled. So this is a simplifying assumption. Now, what drive or what drove the trader's choices between all of these limited market orders, buy and sell, was the private valuation for the asset. So in particular, the trader's total valuation for the asset is given by V plus Y. I guess YI or YT. So Y should have some individual subscript. Because Y is the idiosyncratic valuation for the asset by this particular trader. So these Ys are different across traders. We assume that Y was uniformly distributed on an interval from negative to positive capital Ys. And these are traders' private information, so they are not observed by anyone else, and they are independent across traders. <clears throat> so I have some private valuation YI, you have some different ones, and um, I don't really know anything about your YI, even despite me seeing my own YI. So, of course, notably, this private information does not matter. So, as I, as I just said, me knowing my own why does not give me any information about how you will value the asset, about your idiosyncratic component why. So there is no adverse selection in the market, but this idiosyncratic component will be driving trading decisions. And as a piece of notation, we let capital P, subscript M, superscript B or S to be the probabilities of uh market order to buy or sell respectively arriving next period so these will be the probabilities that a limit order actually executes so that's the model we've seen in class that's the setup that's what we worked with as i said model in the book is slightly different So it simplifies some things and makes other things more complex. Or I guess I sim simplified some things and made other more complex compared to the textbook. So in particular, we looked at exogenous bid and ask prices. Well, the book actually derives them. So today we will 
uh, also B deriving the ask and bid prices. But to illustrate the point, so the degree of complexity that I, that I added was to enrich the distribution of these private valuations. So we assume that they are uniform on an interval, while the book deals with a more restricted setting in which your private valuation is either, is either high or low, positive or negative. So same as we saw uh, this Wednesday in a model of high frequency trading. So today we will assume that yi is actually binary like this. So we will abandon this richness assumption that yi's are uniform. Okay, and uh, if you actually go and read the textbook, then it begins by setting up a, a lot more general model with adverse selection, with random end of trading, or sorry, not random, but general uh trading termination or general patience of traders but the textbook never actually solves this general model instead they do some numerical simulation and then they reduce to this simplified model so we never actually talked about the more general model and we will not do this today either okay one assumption that i made in the lecture is um we implicitly assumed that if limit order book is empty, then it is always filled by the market maker at the same prices at these exogenous ask and bid prices A and B. Well, you don't really need to make this assumption. So from, from how I read the textbook, the textbook does not make this assumption and we did not really need it in class it was more of a convenience so we will not this makes us, we will not make this assumption today either and we'll see how things work if market orders can only trade against previously submitted limit orders okay so just to reiterate we still have one asset whose fundamental value v is commonly known we still have one trader arriving every period but now their private valuation y is binary. It's either minus y or plus y. And they submit market or limit orders, and they can only submit a market order if the limit order book is non-empty. So let's get to the problem. First question that is asked of us is to compute actually the bid and ask quotes in equilibrium. And this is a question that I want to ask you. So this is not something we did in class. But do you have any guesses? How can we compute bid and ask quotes? Where will they come from? I guess I can start the, the, the music. <laughs> started the music but it's it's not playing on stream so you keep thinking for now I will fix my technical no it is playing okay I just start There is no sound because I'm not saying anything. I'm I, I'm still waiting for guesses. Or can we use profit maximization prices, where you account for the different fees? Mm. 
well in a sense yes in a sense uh, they will come from profit maximization and uh, we can start by even ignoring the trading fees right so if we think about the just basic textbook model uh, without the trading fees for now because they will then enter the computation very trivially So how can we compute bid and ask prices? Quotes must be such that traders are indifferent between market and limit orders. And we have a winner. That's exactly right. So basically, we, as usual, we effectively start by guessing what kind of trader behavior we want to see in equilibrium and then we find the prices that generate this behavior and we verify that it is actually an equilibrium so what kind of behavior do we want in this problem we want first of all of course we want traders with high valuation to buy we want traders with low valuation to sell so that part is relatively easy but then how do we choose between market and limit orders? How do we want these traders to choose between market and limit orders? Well, effectively, we want them to use both, right? So they should be indifferent between market and limit orders. One alternative guess that you, that you could make that would be also correct in the model that I gave you is that... Um, you would say, if there is a suitable limit order, then the trader would prefer a market order. And if limit order book is empty, then the trader will submit a limit order. So, do this kind of conditional behavior. This would generate the very same prices. And this would pretty much generate the exact same indifference. So, this would also be a valid approach to the problem. And so going back to Andreas's guess, uh, this would this indifference does come from profit maximization, right? So traders do try to maximize their profit fr from trading. So they do submit the order which maximizes their profit. But this per se does not give us enough information to proceed while um, starting from guessing some, some behavior does give us something. So let us look into this indifference. Let's look at the buy side of the market. Let's look at the trader with a high valuation, with a high YI. So what are the possible profits of this trader from market and limit order? If he submits a market order, assuming that limit order book is non-empty, then he will get v plus y he'll get an asset that's worth v plus y and y equals high equals l so y is positive so he gets an asset that's worth v plus l to him he pays a and he also pays fmo so without any order cost we'll just we would just have had the first three elements but with order cost we also just have them here so as i said they are not really difficult to account for so that's profit from a market buy what a profit from a limit order well once again the trader would get the asset that's worth v plus l to him he would pay less he would only pay b and he would also have to pay flo if the trader if the order executes but this whole thing would only happen with some probability pms so this is the probability that the next trader submits a market order to sell. And as I said, uh, submitting a limit order allows you to get a better price because a bid is lower than the ask. But this better price comes at the cost of the execution risk. So we only have one type of the trader who wants to buy. Therefore, this trader should be indifferent between the two options. 
meaning that the price improvement should exactly offset the execution risk. Now, this indifference would give us a condition on A and B, on prices A and B. And just taking a step back, we are looking for a stationary equilibrium, right? In which prices A and B are still constant, they are the same in every period. I did not say that explicitly, but, uh, but I should have. I don't have any excuse. So we are looking for an equilibrium in which A and B are constant every period. But, uh, no, no but. So this condition, this equals this, will give us a condition on A and B, uh, given some fixed values of V and L, which are parameters of the model, so they are fixed. Given FMO and FLO, which are parameters as well. And also given PSM. Now, this PSM is not a parameter of the model. It is endogenous to equilibrium. It is an equilibrium object. So this probability depends on trader's behavior. <clears throat> so this condition will not be really the final answer to anything. So how do we find this PMS? We know that even if the next trader has a low valuation, so is willing to sell, this trader is indifferent between submitting a market order to sell, which would enter this probability, and submitting a limit order to sell, which would totally screw our buyer today, because he will not get to buy from this next market order. So the question is, how does the next trader be choose between market and limit uh, orders? And here I have no fixed answer for you. So in principle, we can have a lot of equilibria. No, we cannot. Sorry, let me start again. So what you can show through a not immediate, but not prohibitively difficult argument is that this alternative behavior that I told you, you can guess from the start, that if there is a limit or then the next trader will always trade against it rather than submitting limit order, this will be our only possible equilibrium behavior. So if a trader in the next period can trade with trader from period T, if he can submit a market order against T trader's limit order, then this will always happen. This is the thing that will always happen. In equilibrium, trader at T plus one can never submit a limit order uh, if he has a market order, if he has a limit order that can, he can trade against. So why is this so? Why is this the only equilibrium that we can have? Well, suppose that this is not the case. Suppose that the next trader has a low valuation, so he is willing to sell. He sees a limit order to buy in the limit order book, and he decides, no, I'm not going to do that. I will submit a market order instead. If this is what happens in equilibrium, then this cannot actually happen in equilibrium. I realize that that's a tautology, but the whole point of this argument is that it will bring us to a contradiction. So if this is how trader T plus one behaves in equilibrium, given a limit order to buy at price B, then what the trader at time t could have done is to submit a limit order to buy at price b minus epsilon so just undercut this a little bit if this is what he will do so if trader t does so if he submits a buy order at a price slightly below epsilon 
then trader at t plus one is no longer indifferent between submitting a market and limit orders, right? Market order, sorry, b plus epsilon. Yeah, b plus epsilon. So if trader t plus one submits a market order, he will get price b plus epsilon, for sure. If he submits a limit order, he might get price A with some probability. But we know from a similar condition that we will write down for, for him that he is indifferent between getting price B for sure and getting price A with some probability. So if he has a chance of getting price B plus epsilon for sure, this is strictly better for him. So that's the idea, right? Once again, slightly more condensed version. If trader at t plus 1 chooses a limit order even when he has an opportunity to submit a market order, if he does so in equilibrium, then trader at time t can offer him a slightly better price and make trader at t plus 1 choose to submit a market order instead with probability 1. So this kind of deviation would be strictly optimal for trader t because he will get to trade with a larger probability and he will get to realize a profit with larger probability so trader t will do this which brings us to a conclusion that trader t plus one must trade against a limit order whenever it's available trader t plus one must submit a market order when he can okay So this is the only equilibrium that we can have. And this basically pins down the PMS for us. If you remember 10 minutes ago, that's what that was our main question. How do we find out PMS? So let us write down these indifference conditions. This is the indifference condition that we just had. And now we know that PMS is one half. Why is it one half? Because in the next period, the probability that the trader will have yi equal to minus l, the trader will be willing to sell, is exactly one half. Otherwise, the next trader will also have high valuation and he'll be willing to buy. So this probability one half. And we can, um, this gives us one condition that equates a and b, so we can express a in terms of b or vice versa. But to pin them down, we need another condition, and this condition will be given by the similar indifference for the seller, for the trader with y equal to minus L. So this trader, by submitting a market order, will get to sell his asset again at price B, and he will lose an asset of valuation of B minus L for him, and he'll also have to pay FMO in market costs, in market fees. While submitting a limit order to sell, he'll get price A, again minus the fees, minus the asset, but only with probability one half. So once again, the exact same indifference condition. Then you will have the system of these two equations, and you'll have two variables A and B, so you can solve it. If you do the algebra, you will arrive to this. So the half spreads for bid and ask will be exactly the same and they'll be given by some function of L and the market fees. Okay, cool. So that's part A. We found ask and bid prices. And they come from the indifference between market and limit orders. But there is a non-trivial part of determining the behavior of future the behavior of traders conditional on this indifference. So this is the part that we got rid of in the lecture. And assuming this uniform distribution of yi's actually did give us a much simpler uh, model with actually richer predictions. Okay, so let's go, let's go on. Part B asks us to show that the bid ask spread decreases in FMO and increases in FLO. 
basically we can just go back and see that the spread is double this term. So this term in yellow is the half spread. Now you tell me, why does it increase in LO and why does it decrease in MO? Given how exactly ask and bid prices are determined. So, any guesses? This is not... There is no catch here. The answer is quite straightforward. No, no volunteers? Okay, well, it all basically stems from the indifference, right? Once again, all traders must be indifferent in our model between market and limit orders. So if we, for example, increase the cost of limit orders, so if we increase FLO, then what happens? It becomes costlier to submit a limit order, so... Um, they become less appealing for traders. So we need to rebalance the bid and ask prices to restore this indifference. So how do we do it? The probability of execution is unaffected, right? It's always one. It's always going to be one half, given the equilibrium that we've constructed. So execution risk is unaffected by the, these market fees in equilibrium. And recall that market and limit orders trade off this execution risk against price improvement. So to make limit orders more appealing for traders, we need to make this price improvement more drastic. And for a buyer, it's for example, uh, the opportunity to pay B rather than paying A. So he can pay one spread less if he submits a limit order instead of market order. So once again, if we increase FLO, we need to make limit orders more appealing. So we need to make this price improvement more appealing. But this price improvement is exactly the spread. It is exactly the compensation for the execution risk. So if we make limit orders more expensive, the spread should increase. And the argument for market order fees is the mirror opposite. If we increase the market order fees, market orders become less appealing in relation to limit orders, so to restore, uh, to restore the indifference, we need to decrease the appealingness of limit orders, so we need to decrease the price improvement, which means we need to decrease the spread in equilibrium. Simple as that. And part C, just as quickly, Trading platforms often subsidize traders who submit limit orders, meaning that they set negative fees for limit orders and positive fees for market orders. And they claim that this practice ultimately helps to narrow the spread and benefits traders submitting market orders. Holding the total trading fee fixed, is this argument correct? So we've just seen that doing this does help to narrow the spread. This was part B. But does this benefit traders submitting market orders? Once again, I give you the opportunity to answer.
we have a guess. Yes, as the spread decreases more, then the cost for market orders increase. So you're thinking in the right direction. This is exactly what we need to look at. We need to look at the actual prices, which improve when we do this, plus the trading costs for market orders. So you're thinking in the right direction, but if you do the math, uh, what, this is what we'll actually get. So consider, for example, a market order to buy. We get uh, the trader actually pays ask price plus the FMO. But if you substitute, if you plug in the price that we actually found, this is what you will obtain. So just to go back, this was our ask price. We add one FMO here. So this minus two becomes plus one. And in the end, we have that the actual trading cost, the actual amount that the trader pays for a market buy order is given by, by V plus one third L plus F. Meaning that it does not even, does not actually depend on how we split this fee F between limited market orders. Forgot the one third. Happens to the best of us. But yeah. Very good guess. And I guess if you add more time, you will do this. So that was exercise five. A nice little exercise, which does give us a good intuition, which does tell us that these negative limit order fees and cross-subsidizing limit orders with market orders does it help to narrow down the spread nominally, but it does not really necessarily decrease the trading costs. However, it is overall probably a well for enhancing practice. Um, no, it's not, of course not. I was about to say because, well, market orders pay the same, but limit orders get higher price. But that's not correct, is it? Because traders are always indifferent between market and limit orders. So this practice is completely useless. It's not harmful at the very least, and that's, uh, that's good enough. So let's move on to the next problem. This is exercise 3 from chapter 7 that we covered on lecture 8. And what happened on lecture 8 was we talked about market fragmentation, if I remember correctly. And this problem deals with payments for order flow. It explores the consequences of payments for order flow, which is yet another widely spread practice in the real world. So, as we talked back then, back in that lecture, many dealers pay the brokers for directing either the whole order flow towards them, towards the dealer, this particular dealer, or forwarding the order flow from unsophisticated investors. So the second, the latter option is what we are looking at in this problem. So we'll have one risky security, which pays either high or low. So it's ex-ante expected fundamental value is mu, and its actual fundamental value is either that plus or minus sigma. And this is with equal probabilities, and that's it. So we have one investor who arrives at the market, and gives his broker an order to buy or sell. Now this investor can be one of the few types. So with probability phi, he is a retail investor. A retail investor is a retail investor. Typos be typos. So with probability phi, he is a retail investor and he is definitely not aware of the true fundamental value of the asset. So if he is a retail investor, he buys and sells randomly with, with equal probabilities. With probability 1 minus phi, our investor is institutional investor. So not a person walking into a bank, but uh, 
a big company walking into a bank. But there are different kinds of institutional investors, right? There are pension funds who are uninformed, and there are, say, I don't know, hedge funds, algo trading firms, who are informed. So institutional investor, we say, is informed with probability alpha, conditional on being an institutional investor. And informed investor, of course, knows the true value of the asset, knows the true V. If an institutional investor is uninformed of the true V, then he also buys and sells randomly with equal probabilities, just like retail investor. Now we have three risk-neutral dealers in the market. We'll label them as 1, 2, and 3. They post the quotes before the broker contacts them. They do behave strategically. Um, the book says that the broker cannot split his order among dealers. And I'm not sure why this matters, because we still we have just one unit to trade anyways. So I guess it's a simplifying assumption to avoid those mixed strategies when you split this one unit from one trader. Uh, but yeah, broker cannot split his order among dealers. And dealers, as usual, are also uninformed, so they have no private information about V. They do not know any better than uh, retail investors or uninformed institutional investors. So this is the setup. Broker does nothing for the moment. We'll get back to him in a few. So in part A, we want to assume that there is no payment for order flow between the broker and the three dealers. In this case, the broker randomly selects one dealer among those posting the best price for his order. And we need to compute the bid and ask quotes posted by the dealers. As usual, the question to you, how do we compute bid and ask quotes in this case? And this model must remind you of something that is really well known to you by now. So tell me. Yes, from Frederick, as in GM model, set ask equal to expected value conditional on buy order. 10 points to Gryffindor. That's exactly right. If you look very closely at this model, this is exactly Gloucester Milgram model. We have one unit to trade, and uh, it either comes from informed trader or the uninformed trader. So dealers have no informational advantage and they are trading at zero profit. It is, however, non-trivial. So there is one subtle point here. And this is the fact that dealers obtain zero profit. Back in Gloucester Milgram model, this came from us directly assuming that dealers are competitive, right? So there is, there is an infinite number of them, and they are competing with each other. In this case, there are just three of them, and they are interacting with each other strategically. So they, keep in, they know what other dealers will post in equilibrium, what quotes they will post, and they respond to that. But the point is, this will still produce competitive behavior, because dealers um, well, are competing with each other. Basically, if, if any single dealer posts some quotes that are expected to generate a profit for him, then the other two can undercut and uh, steal all the order flow. So this is Bertrand competition. And due to this price competition, uh, oligopoly and seeming presence of market power does not actually materialize. So there is no actual market power, even though there are few dealers and they might uh, collude with each other. Okay, so how do we do this? Let's apply Gloss and Milgram model. Our S price will be exactly the expected value 
of V conditional on the order being a by order. So if the order comes from the uninformed, then this value, value V is equal to mu. If the order comes from informed trader, then V is equal to mu plus sigma. Because informed trader only wants to buy if V is high, so if V is equal to mu plus sigma, right? Which means that we can write this expectation in this form. It's mu plus sigma times the probability that the order comes from the informed trader. I'm doing it the fast way, but you're more than welcome to do it uh, the, the proper way that we did in lecture, if you so prefer. So we just need to compute this probability at this point. So what's the probability of trader of the buy order coming from the informed trader? The total probability is this 1 minus phi, so the probability the trader is institutional and informed, so 1 minus phi times alpha. Divided by 2, because that's the probability that the value is high. So this numerator gives us the total ex ante probability of receiving a buy order from an informed trader. In the denominator, for the Bayes rule, we need to see the probability of receiving a buy order, period. So if we just go quickly here, a reminder for how Bayes rule looks, even though you should know it by, by heart by now. Probability of, let's say, x conditional on y is equal to a probability of x and y divided by the probability of y. This is what we're doing here. In our case, x is the event that the trader is informed, y is the event that a buy order is submitted to the broker. So we need to find the joint probability of an informed trader submitting a buy order divided by the total probability of receiving a buy order. Nope, I keep forgetting to mute the music afterwards. Uh, yeah, so the total probability of receiving a buy order is probability of receiving a buy order from the informed trader, which we've just found to be 1 minus phi times alpha divided by 2. But we can also receive a buy order from either a retail trader, which does it with probability phi over 2. Trader is retail with probability phi, and he mixes 50-50 between buy and sell, so the probability of a buy is phi over 2. And the same 1 over 2 applies to institutional uninformed investors. So investor is insti institutional with probability 1 minus phi, is uninformed conditional on that with probability 1 minus alpha. This gives us the probability of receiving a buy order from an uninformed institutional investor. If we simplify this big fraction, what we end up with is just 1 minus phi times alpha. because the denominator sums up to one two, to one half. And this gives us the ask price. It's just mu plus this half spread. You do the same motion for the bid price and you will obtain the same result. B will be equal to, the bid will be equal to the mid quote minus the same half spread. So that's how we find the bid and ask quotes, and let's move on. In part B, we now enter the order flow payment realm. So now we want to assume that dealer 1 has a payment for order flow arrangement, under which the broker gives dealer 1 all orders from retail investors, and the dealer commits to execute all these orders at the best quotes. Meaning at the ask and bid prices set by the two remaining dealers. And other orders are sent to dealers 2 and 3 as in question A. So what are the quotes posted by dealers 2 and 3? Deduce that the bid ask spread is higher in this case than when there is no payment for the order flow. So this is how the broker enters the model. The broker now serves as a router 
he decides whom to forward the order. And now, if the order came from a retail investor, it's sent to dealer 1. If the order came from an institutional investor, it is sent to dealers 2 and 3. So we need to find the quotes posted by dealers 2 and 3. And we do it in the exact same way. Once again, these two dealers, even though there are just two of them, they are still engaging in that price competition with each other and they will compete away any profits. So they will be posting bid and ask quotes at, uh, which generate zero profits for them. So to find bid and ask quotes, we need to find, for example, for the ask price, what is the expected value of V conditional on receiving a buy order that is known to come from an institutional investor? So in equilibrium, dealers 2 and 3 will be aware of this order flow arrangement. So they will know that they only receive buy orders from institutional investors. Because all orders from retail investors are forwarded to dealer 1. So this fact will enter their inference and will enter their pricing decisions. So to derive the S price, we need to find the probability of a trader being informed, conditional on the dealer receiving a buy order, and the trader being an institutional investor. This is the exact same fraction. Not a very good highlight. Except we no longer have the phi over 2 here in the denominator. We no longer have the possibility that the buy order comes from a retail investor. If we go back, this is the phi I'm talking about. This is the only thing that changes. Oops. So in the end, our S price will be just given by mu plus alpha sigma. Because this whole fraction reduces to alpha, because the denominator sums up to 1 minus phi over 2. And it's not too difficult to observe that mu plus alpha times sigma is indeed greater than our S price in part A. So our half spread is larger. Our half spread for the bid price will also be larger because we do the same, the exact same thing. Meaning that the bid ask spread will indeed be higher in this case than when there is no payment for the order flow. Now we are overdue for the break, but let me finish this problem another five minutes or so and we'll take a break after that. So part C asks us. What if there is a payment of dealer 1 to the broker, P? Although I guess there are two more parts to this problem, maybe eight minutes. So let P be the payment of dealer 1 to the broker. What's the largest possible value of P? And again, let me forward this question to you as the informed students. How do we find the largest possible value of P? What other value? Value of what? What other value is it connected to? Let me know. Now it's time for your guesses. Now I am still saying guesses as I do in lectures for our Blitz quizzes, but there I mostly quiz you on 
some random facts that you do not expect to know, so that's more for entertainment. Here today, I'm asking you to solve the problems, and this is something that you should be able to do. So, slightly different kinds of questions compared to lectures. Just pointing it out. Guess from Andres. The, or the originally profit of dealer ones of dealer one can't be negative, so it's possible to solve the profit when dealer one gets all retail and pays P. Exactly. So dealer one will only be willing to pay um, P if this is better than just abandoning this agreement and going back to the equilibrium in part A with no order flow agreement. In that case, he gets profit zero. So the total profit of the dealer of dealer one net of this payment P should be non-negative. And that's basically the condition that we want to look at. So we just need to compute the profit of dealer one in this case in, in this equilibrium from part B. And dealer one obtains A minus mu from every single buy order. Right, he gets to sell the asset at price A, but he knows that the value of this asset is mu, because the order flow is uninformative from retail investors. So he receives a half spread equal to alpha sigma. And once again, this ask price and the bid price that will follow come from this equilibrium in part B. So these prices. because that's our equilibrium with the order flow agreement. So the dealer one receives alpha sigma from any buy order, he receives the same alpha sigma from any sell order, which means that is his per order profit from any order that he receives. So he is willing to pay the broker any amount up to this amount, up to alpha times sigma per order. Any amount P in between, in between the two is good enough. It's fine for dealer one. So quick and simple. And the last part of the problem asks us, is payment for order flow beneficial or detrimental to investors? And the question is very quick and easy. I will not even set the music. You just quickly tell me. Is it good or bad for investors and why so? in two words. Maybe I should have put the music. Okay, but there's really no need to think that hard on this question. All investors here trade at worse prices. So they all trade at the new prices A and B from part B. And these prices are worse for the investors because the spread is wider. So that's, that's pretty much it. So payment for order flow is detrimental to investors. They lose from this uh, agreement being in place. And who profits from this is dealer one and the broker. So dealer one gets positive profit instead of zero profit that he would have gotten otherwise. Broker also presumably receives some share of that surplus. So broker does receive this P from part C. We do not know how dealer one and the broker negotiate this P. But, you know, if the broker has some bargaining power, then the broker will get some of it. Finally, there is one possibility that once again is beyond the scope of the model, but that might be in place in the real world. And this is if brokers are competitive. If there are many brokers and they compete with each other, which is not the case in the model where we only have one broker, 
But if this would be the case, then the broker could be competing with each other in terms of the prices that they offer to their clients. So they would effectively post quotes, same as dealers, and they would compete in these quotes and they would compete away all the profit that they get from, uh, from the overflow payments. So in principle, it might be the case that some of the profit is transmitted to the investors. And then it might be the case that um, it's not split equally between different kinds of investors. You would think that institutional investors are more valuable. They have more bargaining power than retail investors. So they might get more of this, uh, of this price improvement. But then these are just guesses. So this concludes exercises from lectures 7 and 8. We have seen that um, asymmetric fees for market and limit orders are somewhat pointless, at least in that model, in parlor model. And we've seen that payments for order flow allow dealer and broker to proliferate at the cost of the investors. So what we'll do now is we will move uh, to problem three from problem set one. But before that, we will take a five minute break. And then we'll be back.